going to present you some research I've been carrying in Namibia, mostly Western Namibia, uh, an area which is called former Ganarhan. And um, in this specific presentation, we try to trace back the origin of the Gamara um, from linguistic and genetic data which has been published but I'm not uh, producing myself and that I compare with some uh, historical material I've collected in the field. And, um, and the idea uh, is to, to talk about the origin would be to, to trace back um, the, evolu the, kind of the joint evolution of uh, identities and political structures of the Gamara uh, in relation to space. Um, this is the outline of the presentation with a short introduction and then uh, a part about the region, a part about the identities and a short conclusion. Um, briefly, Namibia was a, uh, a colonized lately and has its independence lately. And for this reason, there is um, an issue historical material available and the area could only made back from the 18th century. And the NFA part was in uh, independence in 1990. So most of the um, historical material produced has been framed within this uh, time span context. And the Damara represents about 80,000 speakers today. They all live in the media and um, they've been subject of some ethnographic needs and this, this representation um, related to an uncertain region and, re and they were thought to be hunted together, subjugated by the Nama, which is a political group, uh, and living in the mountains. And this has also like, framed the anthropology, uh, the contemporary anthropology of the Nama and their place in the Namibia as a And uh, as one well, of um, informant says, our history is not documented properly and we don't know where the colonial master of our country cannot record the history of our own system. It caused a lot of confusion, confusion in our culture. And, um, he, we will see through the presentation, it means, of course, that the colonial agenda has framed uh, the history of the Damara, or the writing of the history of the Damara, but there is also a fact that it's poorly documented compared to some Bantu groups and which we shall present in the media. And, uh, and the various uh, historical lawyers uh, or in their twin and blurry and mixed together and, um, and um, people don't really know on which feet they should stand uh, because they hear something and they provide um, About the methodology of the data, <coughs> uh, simply anthropological method methods of semi-structure interview, participatory observations, uh, a bit of planship to understand who was who and uh, GPS tagging in some places, mostly in so Western media. And the uh, source of that, I used um, scientific literature like the story accounts, uh, colonial contemporary ethnographies, some history books, etc. Um, also some uh, law, like past and present laws, um, archive, especially like proceedings of the land conference and proceedings of the conference of, of traditional authorities, which were supposed to have just after the Indian government. And uh, sometimes a newspaper with information. And, uh, and uh, along this I do uh, ethnography and ethnohistory material made in Peru and customary law and textual documents which were produced by the Damara over the past 10-15 years. And sometimes I write with also a source of information because there's room for people to come. Um, there's two points that uh, an Namibian historian has been rising her writing, it's one of the leading Canadian historians. It's like history is made of change, and so the various accounts uh, that we have may, may reflect uh, the situation at the time, and even if they may be floated by some uh, framing agendas and etc. Uh, I try to, to see whether they can reflect a certain evolution also. And not simply, uh, this one is wrong, it's like this, and this one is wrong, it's like this, because the way of thinking has changed at the time. And, um, and she also insists on the history and moral material as, a, as evidence and which has heuristic value in, uh, in societies where you don't have written documents for, for the time. Um, this is for introduction. About, if we speak about the origin of the Damara, just 
in line of context with the Khoisan population, you find um, a woman. The term Khoisan was in invented by Schultz in 1928 to put together the poem of the Khotentots and the Sun for the Bushman population. And it's only now that it may seem that it reflects something real. It's not sure yet that Henry Pearson, but recent genetic publications suggest some yes. And it has also been used as a linguistic category to put together uh, different languages which today are not related to each other. You have at least five families, which are not five families of families which are not related to each other. Um, and the place of the camera in this, um, let's say, Christian transcription. Oops. Okay. Um, they, are, they have a non-Koisan biological profile, and as you can see here, there are few Koisan speaking population who have a non-Koisan biological profile. And uh, they were his historically associated with some Nilo Saharan population and later on with some Namibian Bantu populations for this reason. But yet they speak a Korekogoba, which is a Korekwati language that has been, and historically it has been said that they learned from the Nama, which is a Korekogoba uh, in Namibia. Um, recent uh, well, writings in the linguistic has suggested that. Proto, the Guaycuati language emerged in northern Botswana about 2,000 years ago, and uh, that the westward migration took place like 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and led to the population known as the Kwadi in southern Angola, which now is almost the Kwadi anymore, and, and that the Damara may be a southern part of this, uh, of this migration. And this, this writing were contested because of uh, um, uh, weak methodology, but recent uh, work on Koekogaba dialect actually defined this hypothesis and shows that the northern Koekogaba dialect are closely related to the proto language uh, that emerged in the Zero Bosman than the southern language uh, spoken by the Koekogaba population. Uh, and so this, this writer defines the hypothesis that the Damara are speaking the Koekogaba language before being in Namibia and before entering, before meeting the land, which is an important change in terms of uh, where they come from and what their own way to And this is work from 2008 and 2014. Uh, and based both on vocabulary and grammatical analysis of the language. Uh, then, genetic studies, recent genetic studies shows that the Damara has about 90% 90, 90 of their uh, genome of non koisan origin, and that the metissage between koisan um, and non koisan genome in the Damara population date back about 25 generations, which is about 750 years ago, roughly. Uh, we can also see now that there is a high clone population whose um, whose proportion of non-coincident genome is about 40, 50 percent, um, but the latest has been back to about the same time, like 28 generation. It's not precise at what generation is. Is it 5, 10, 25, 50? So it gives, a, it gives an idea it's about at the same time. And uh, other um, recent research in genetics shows that the Dama, the Dama people uh, almost at 100 percent not belongs from the same uh, populations and the Namibian Bantu populations, which was also something we first said for a long time. Uh, but there is tracks, uh, tracks of uh, intense ex exchange of women with the uh, hero population, which are Namibian Bantu population, uh, which who arrived in Namibia in the 15th century. Um, if we pay attention to what the Damara is saying about themselves today, um, they generally say that there are few examples that they came from Namibia from the north. Uh, it could be Angola, Ecuador, Jungle, according to their source, it differs, but you find a lot of reference to this. And that they were settled between the Kunene River, which flow here and there in southern Angola, and the Kawongo River, which flow from the Kawongo Delta way, from southern Angola to Argentina. And that they were settled in this area and in an area called uh, Angola which is here, in really northern and other source of, uh, of, um, of, of data says that the ancestor of a certain Damara group 
where called people from the forest, and they were living close to the high Madana, high Gladana, which are forest bound. So there's a lot of um, lot of uh, place, lot of lot of um, source of information who relate a certain relation between the level and the population, but not as belonging from the same, but having been living in the same area for some time. Um, if I can give you another example, some say, and it's quite important in contemporary Namibia, uh, they often say that they are like indigenous to the country as well. And they say that they, there was, for instance, here a break, or a break of long on earth or something like this, and they were originating from this area which is just south from the Toshaban. And, um, and this, is, um, this is something you find quite often uh, along with some origins like, out of Namibia. And uh, the same uh, informant says that the Gamara you use to collect salt, salt uh, in the Toshaban, and that the Orombo people, also about to group of Namibia, are also used to collect salt in, in this area. And there were like some inter 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 conflict and etc. which led the camera to move from this area. Um, out of these informations and um, much more of a few examples of, of the, what's, what, what is said by contemporary cameras, um, it appears that um, there is connection between the I call it I present no Kohen, which means black. No is black and Kohen is people, person. Uh, um, because they were calling themselves this way. They say they were calling themselves this way to differentiate from the same population who were lighter skin. Uh, and the Heihom, Heihom, which is a, which is a population from the northern Namibia. And out of this uh, genetic data, linguistic data, and ethnographic data that I want to stay here, uh, where the Damara says that there is Arodaman grouping and the Haitun grouping says they have a Arodaman sound because they are known as sound today in Namibia. Um, it appears that the Damara came from, most probably came from Mosel Botswana thousand years ago and we are in northern Namibia, southern, uh, southern Angola for a time and the arrival of the Bantu accelerated their immigration in Namibia uh, about 700, 800 years ago. And the high wind would be the front of migration would have uh, mixed a lot with the residing sun population you have in this area. Um, basically, this is the main... Uh, well, the Demara also defined this somehow. And I, I can go into detail of the connection between the Demara and the tree. But they relate a lot of things saying that some were elected as the Mara, uh, while they are not the Mara, they are Bushman, and etc. But both speak the same language, it's just a direct difference. Some say that one has learned the language from the other, and the other one says the other way wrong. Uh, and further research has to be done to assess it at 100%, but this is said by uh, different sources of information. Um, when it comes to the identity and the contemporary uh, Damara identities and localities, um, the story continues by saying that um, following various tribal conflicts in northern Namibia, they met at the place called Kanu, uh, which is inside, like somewhere here, and they separated from this area. Um, and um, and Damara says, as they moved to other places within Namibia, they get to know to be named according to this area. And this is that is how the Damara occupied the land. This is what people say to And another example uh, from another source it says that the Damara were living peacefully in a single room in an area which is basically a distant famous area of the different area here. And uh, they add that both royal historical records as the Damara were entering conflict with some uh, some um, Bantu population coming from the north, and the result of this conflict was that the Damara dispersed into the splinter groups, etc. So once more time, we find again this idea that uh, they spread into Namibia, where they were likely like about 500 years ago, 
and uh, and and, uh, and we're mostly using Modern and Media for for the time frame. That is before speed speeding. And uh, the result of this was that you know you can identify quite a few uh, camera groupings, camera names of identity groups um, in various parts of the media. This map is just uh, as an information map. It comes from a school book of the 70s, and there's about 1249 here and some few more uh, within the group. And, um, Another, another writer has been doing a kind of genealogy of the grouping according to the tapes and etc. And the genealogy he proposed um, fit to the various uh, front of migration the Damara are telling today when they say, okay, a group moved eastward, the group moved southward, a group moved westward, and we find the same front of migration that people are relating today in this genealogy based on tapes and uh, its of origin and etc. Um, However, according to the source, you don't have the same number and the same name of groupings, uh, whether it's in like uh, colonial ethnography, let's say contemporary ethnography, uh, general anthropology book about the Indian population, or uh, customary um, profile of the Mara communities that they have been produced for the rest of the past years. Uh, and uh, doing, let's say, uh, in deep uh, interview about the various Damara identities, I could even identify some name of groupings that I couldn't find in any of the sources, uh, where it was explained that this grouping is living in this river bed, and this grouping is living a bit further north, and this one is living in the mountainous area just right here, and this one in this river bed, and etc. And, um, and, uh, and the idea is that um, through migrating within Namibia and uh, setting in different places, the various identities started to rise. And uh, the term close actually means family, clan, tribe. Uh, at the origin, it was only family, apparently, according to a etymological dictionary. And today, it can refer both to a lineage based endogenous group of people or a broader linguistic lineage and land based group. Um, and this broad Groups would rather fit to modern linguistic imagination and based grouping, while this one rather uh, fit the idea of uh, lineage based examples kind of people living in a given place. And um, all this house grass means within house. Um, and today, this group, you can say like Damaran Kraus, which is my nation Damara, but you, go, you can also say the Redaman Kraus. But in re considering that the Maran cows, then the red amount would be a cause mass, for instance, etc. So you have different levels, but there is no, no really structure or hierarchy on this term. I found it only once in one document and never had it from uh, someone who spoke. And uh, it's only present in the dictionary and one document. So I guess this one is quite elastic. And, well, I, I understand it as a quite elastic one. And each of these cows come into being in relation to a kus, which is the term it's round, brown, but this is the feminine form which refers to the rather small place of the world, which are named place of, of the weather and state. Otherwise it would be kub with a B as a masculine form. Um, and, and as as Madamara as a let's say the, the green arrow shows the Bantu immigration in the 15th century, and this one is also uh, the hero groups when deep into the area. And the southern, the southern arrow are uh, Nama groups coming from uh, South, South Africa in the 17th century. And the idea is both, both groups were quite powerful, cattle herders, while the Nama were said to be hunter gatherers, or at least pasto foraging combination, practicing a pasto foraging combination. Um, both group entered in conflict, and were quite non thirsty and etc. The various grouping got progressively isolated, not solely in mountains that it was used to be safe, but in uh, localized area and this uh, fosters the emergence of uh, localized identities in relation, in relation to them on a specific place. Is in, uh, most of these names are uh, name of place or eventually name of uh, certain practice. 
relate that this was the the, the, how say, the succession of paranoid chiefs but you can easily see it's like 13, 19, 15, 40, 19, 15, 40, 65, 19, 15, 40, 65, 19, 15, 40, 65. So this time pattern, they, they don't really know the date, it's just okay, it's the 30 years, the generation. And this name are found within the, the oral history of the Damara, like relating that they had a conflict this side and this person was living the this war, if I can say, and so on. But you also find within the same succession, Colonel Gisdorosan, who was appointed as an American in 1984. And then you find only Gorosan people, like Juba Gorosan, 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 until Justus Gawai, who was not from the bloodline of the Gorosan, but was a consular of David Gorosan, because this Damara king had few consular, 306 and etc. And uh, when the apartheid and the Demaran was established, the Demaran was divided in 12 wards, and Justus Gawa became the chief of the Demaran, like the head person of the Demaran. And divided into 12 wards, each ward was uh, under one chief and three headmans. And through, through this, um, you observe uh, um, the emergence of a structured political system like with a, with a hierarchy and, um, and titles which are different according to where you are if you are uh, in the, let's say, the head, uh, head town here or within the world and etc. Um, and people complain there is some, of, of course, some of the chiefs are acknowledged, some are not acknowledged. And um, some people say that this chief of world were not chief of your community, they were not chief of a group to a chief of the world. They still have a lot of power because people have been resettled from various places in northern Namibia to war each of these wars. And indeed, these people brought them. But at this time, between the ten, ha, ha, first half of the 20th century, you have a kind of switch and mix between customary chief and political leaders who got to be powerful through leading uh, political parties, and even if this time is uh, not really uh, welcome today, um, it was, some Damara say that it was a golden age of the Damara because they were like represented, like all of them were represented and had some kind of authority and something, but you know, it's much more uh, really and uh, In 1995, after independence, Namibia proclaimed the Traditional Authority Act, and um, Various chief and leaders could ask for recognition. And this has led to tremendous conflict. Uh, as people say before, before we were just the Marat, but when this TA, traditional authority history, came, everything just boom. Um, because there were a long conflict about which chief should, should have which authority on which part. Even if these boundaries do not exist at independence time, they were still uh, strong and uh, renewable. But because of this conflict, um, the central government um, gazetted one Damara royal house um, under the chieftainship of Justus Gawai, still also the head and founder of uh, UDF. This is Damara United Front and this is United Democratic Front because we are post apartheid and political parties cannot follow uh, ethnic boundaries. But still, it's the same person who who was heading the Damara Royal House and he had been consular in 54, junior consular. Um, and uh, because that there were a lot of complaints and because the Damara people know that they don't fall under parent chief, even if they acknowledge him because it was a golden age uh, at some time, they also know that their political structure is not functioning this way. And there were a lot of complaints and conflict. The um, Minister of Local and Regional Government appointed a group of, uh, let's say, educated and uh, knowledgeable Damara to write a report about the history of traditional authorities. And they came out with the fact that there is eight consolidated Damara, Damara groups. And after that, okay. and after that, um, the Central Government uh, recognized five and then seven, seven uh, Damara traditional authorities representing each Damara group. All of them made by of one chief, six senior consular, six junior consulars. Um, 
uh, when, when through this, as these traditional authorities reflect uh, traditional communities, their name, all the various groupings were kind of brought together under broader groups, like, if I can take an example, for instance, here, I mentioned the Laoredaman, okay, here I mentioned the Laoredaman, it's one group which is recognized, and all of these groupings know for <coughs> Laoredaman do not exist in the face of the state. And the concealer or not concealer of one group, the area representative of the group. Um, okay. But um, I did manage to meet the, the person who wrote this report, and, but he was saying that they have like heavily neglected the south of Namibia because the moment, then, then there are people who say that they have been doing even through the Orange River and then back. And also they have neglected Lausanne and the preserves they recognize them as traditional authorities or whether in former Navarra or whether in urban areas where you have a concentration of them uh, which are brought here for labor or various issues. Um, this again reflect um, reflect how uh, contemporary Navarra identities were made through history on uh, both pre-colonial well, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial histories and, um, and the institution making, I would say. Okay, and, um, and this, um, you recognize, and, and, uh, and this, this recognition of traditional is really important for both identity and uh, legacy issue, but also a uh, legal and poor issue because traditional authorities are working in an intertwined complex system going along the communal and reform and along community conservation institution who has quite some right over game and wildlife and can enter a joint venture with private operators and have finally um, getting a few, hundred, few millions of Namibian dollars per year which is quite significant for the um, and, uh, and today if you apply to a, to a long title in communal land, this one title is given in a given Daoredaman, for instance, a certain grouping communal area. So the various identities are no linked to traditional authorities recognized by the central government and which each has their own jurisdiction area. But officially, the jurisdiction area are not uh, fixed by the central government, but the community conservation institution unfold following the former boundaries of uh, of the Damara and the various uh, chief. And in this respect, it perpetrates um, the boundaries of the traditional authority. It defines and perpetrates the boundaries of the traditional authority and their jurisdiction area. Yeah. Um, this is. Um, this is uh, the, the, the process I wanted to, to, to go through. And, uh, which, which actually helps a lot to understand um, what's happening today in uh, rural areas and why you have this kind of um, struggle to have power over certain institution or certain area and claim a conflict between groupings. Uh, and it's especially strong in an area where uh, former chiefs were not recognized. And uh, at, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, we can conclude that the social and local organization of the Damara, as we observe it today, is a result of this various historical process. And uh, as that we observe uh, a slide of mix between uh, a non-structured political system and a structured political system along, then we observe a slide of mix between uh, customary chief and political leaders. And in parallel to this, the central government, by recognizing uh, traditional groups, in a limited number because they also sit in the Council of Traditional Leaders advising the President and each, um, each Namibian group, the Damaras, the Bambos, the Herero, etc., have about the same number of uh, traditional authority recognized. So you have 50 traditional authorities, and you have about 8 social cultural groupings in Namibia, and each of them has about 5 to 10 seats. So it's also part of the group. Traditional authorities will get to be part of the state structure has to deal with um, civic cases by creating community uh, community courts, uh, 
and, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, in, um, um, in terms of identity, uh, there is no legal room for the small grouping to exist uh, as traditional authorities, as traditional community, and, uh, and the number has been fixed at eight. And it won't change in no for many reasons. Um, this, this, this formalization of political structure reduces uh, the possibility of emergence and the period of grouping through fusion or fission, as it was used to be, and, um, and, and uh, freeze the identities that, as I said, uh, become unseparatable from state organizations, the traditional authorities, uh, and their jurisdiction area. I forgot to make a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>